quest to find the perfect sitting position goes as far back as the early days of the instrument. Today it continues to elude guitar players, regardless of level and experience. And rightfully so, it's the foundation of everything we do, and the slightest changes make a big impact on a whole variety of aspects of our playing, so it can be difficult to pinpoint the issues around it. In this video, we'll take a deep dive into positioning the guitar, not through a list of generic rules, but by exploring it systematically, going through all possible rotations and their impact on your left and right hand. So you'll be able to walk away with a system that you can use to address any issues in your playing and establish a solid foundation for an efficient technique. As the guitar building techniques and materials evolved over centuries, the shape and size of the instrument also went through a transformation. In the meanwhile, the increasingly complex repertoire led guitar players to experiment with different positions and devices, searching for the most effective sitting position. Some of these early trials are really creative and some are a little over the top, though it's still interesting to see all the historical context. But what's so tricky about the sitting position? Well, it needs to satisfy a few conditions as a reliable foundation. It has to be a balanced, relaxed and comfortable posture that facilitates an optimal placement for the hands. All these so far apply to most instruments, but for us, guitar players, there is another important function of the sitting position, which is keeping the guitar stable. And that's where the problems start. The guitar is the largest instrument, well, if you don't count the tuba, largest that's held without the use of any external stabilizer. Think of cello, double bass, right, supported by an end pin. So unless you go for drastic solutions like the Brahms guitar, our own body is the stabilizing mechanism. And that in and of itself leads to complications. For one, our hands and arms are obviously not locked in place while playing, which really compromises their stabilizing role. You may be thinking, why not just choose the traditional default, you know, using a footstool, raising the left leg, placing the guitar on the thigh. This position actually does a decent job stabilizing the guitar, so it's not a bad place to start. But it fails to satisfy the first condition, which is, I think, more important than, than stability. Because it relates to your health, uh, your spine health, actually. If you ever had long enough practice sessions, you know it's not the most comfortable or the healthiest for your back, especially depending on how far you raise your leg and the amount of spine rotation. Even just sitting down uh, in front of a TV, computer, for long periods of time can lead to serious health consequences, let alone sitting with your spine in a twisted position, right? And this is one of the reasons we see a surge of devices and a variety of support systems as an alternative. In the second part of the video, we'll go over these support devices and talk more about the stability issue and compare some of the solutions I've personally used and recommended to students over the years, including a custom setup that I worked on that enables a sort of a hands-free playing position. But there is no one-size-fits-all solution, because keep in mind there are many different factors in play here for each individual, like the shape and size of the torso, length of the arms, even the size of the guitar all play a big role. So without a deep understanding of the underlying principles and basic techniques we need to establish, any generalized tips are going to fall short. The principles we'll be covering are going to apply regardless of your current setup, because we'll walk through each aspect along with specific technical goals, so you can decide for yourself if the conventional position is right for you, or if you want to adopt any other solution or perhaps come up with your own custom setup based on your specific goals or needs. So let's head over to the studio to take a closer look at all these aspects and their effects on your technique. Positioning of an object and its orientation in space can be defined using a three-dimensional system, or for math geeks, the Cartesian coordinate system. Now, we're not gonna go deep into geometry, you know, calculating coordinates and so on, Though math and music cross paths in some interesting ways, so maybe for another video. But breaking down the guitar's position and orientation into its components gives us a whole new perspective. Because its rotation around these three axes, which are the X, Y, and the Z axis, will impact different aspects of your playing, 
or your technique, as we'll see in a little bit. We'll start with the rotation of the guitar around the x-axis. In other words, the longitudinal rotation. This is usually the only rotation that beginners consider when sitting down with their guitar for the first time. It determines how high an angle the neck will be. And that affects one of the most important aspects of the left hand position, which is the angle of your knuckle joints with respect to the fingerboard. If you think of this imaginary line through the knuckles, you want that line to be parallel to the fretboard, not at an angle like so, either direction, but parallel. And that'll give each finger an equal opportunity to reach all the strings across the fingerboard. Now keep in mind, in more advanced levels, there'll be an exception to almost every basic rule we talk about early on. For example, there'll be cases where we don't want the knuckles to be parallel. But all these exceptions shouldn't affect the baseline and your overall sitting position. So what are the consequences of this rotation? And how do you find the perfect spot? Let's try a simple experiment for the wrist issue. When you lift your arm up without moving your wrist, so just the elbow, right? You'll notice your palm naturally ends up at a steep angle rather than horizontal, which takes an extra effort. So rotating the guitar higher up will match this angle closer and it's going to make it easier to keep your knuckles parallel. This is especially useful for those having difficulty with the wrist rotation due to physical limitations or a disability. But regardless, it's good to keep in mind um, it's more of a natural position for the wrist to be in. Another upside to a larger rotation is that it brings the headstock and the whole fretboard closer to your body. So it's going to be a shorter distance to reach the frets, which means better control overall. But all of this comes at a price for the right hand. Too steep an angle means a greater distance to your default plucking spot on the strings, which should be just below the sound hole. Also, it'll compromise your plucking angle. We'll cover the right hand in detail in a separate video, but basically, you want your fingers to contact and pluck the strings at an angle as opposed to straight on, like so. So choosing a lower angle for the x-axis rotation will bring us closer to this ideal plucking angle without having to contort your wrist. Here's another use case for this rotation, and a cautionary note. It's a common issue to have the edge of the guitar here applying constant pressure on the forearm. But that's where we have all the flexor tendons and the nerves for the hand that pass through, right? And depending on how much force you apply down, this can cause numbness, tangling on the fingers, and even more serious issues like tendonitis in the long run. At the very least, it'll impede your progress on the right hand, whether it's speed, dexterity, or endurance. The closer to your hand you have this pressure spot, the higher the risk is even if you're using a guitar with a contoured edge. So by choosing a steeper angle, a larger rotation, you'll be lowering the body of the instrument, or the lower bout of the guitar, away from your elbow, and you'll end up in that problematic spot. And here, the only option to remedy this is going to be to lighten the pressure with some help from your shoulder muscles, which then of course compromises the stability of the guitar. Instead of all that, you can simply clear the forearm from the edge by using a slight downward rotation, like so. So that's another important consideration for this rotation. But we'll come back to this issue and fine tune it a bit more when we talk about the uh, vertical rotation. To sum it up so far, the rotation around the x-axis mainly controls the balance between keeping your left hand knuckles parallel to the neck versus keeping your right hand fingers at a reasonable angle to the strings. Though keep in mind this is not about finding an absolutely perfect spot for both hands, but more of a search for the optimal position. And we have two other forms of rotation that will provide even more opportunities to customize the setup. The second rotation 
is the one around the y-axis and that will determine the lateral tilt of the guitar. And this relates to another important uh, technical aspect for the left hand. To be able to play anything polyphonic on the guitar, meaning involving more than a single voice, your fingers need to stay clear of the neighboring strings as you're playing, especially the, the string below. And to do that, you want to make sure each fingertip frets the strings at around a 90 degree angle, almost perpendicularly. Can you guess how the y-axis rotation is relevant to this? It directly impacts this angle, right? Because in order to maintain this landing angle at around 90 degrees, it'll determine how far you'll, you'll need to flex your wrist. Using too much of a tilt backwards will require a greater bend on the wrist. And that's a common mistake among beginners. You know, it's tempting to look at the fingerboard to see exactly where the frets are in the beginning or which strings to pluck, right? But we want both wrists to be as straight and relaxed as possible, again, with some exceptions in the advanced levels, but keeping them in a straight, more natural state will greatly improve dexterity. So then why not go the other direction and rotate forward, right? That'll definitely put the left wrist in a more natural position, but for the right wrist, not at all, because you'll have a similar problem. To reach the strings, you'll have to bend your wrist a lot more and add some unnecessary tension here on the right shoulder to reach forward. What's the solution? The ideal angle is going to be somewhere between just a slight tilt back to none at all. Even just a few degrees will go a long way, so you'll have to experiment with it to find the optimal bend for your left wrist to keep the fingertips at that ideal landing position while not compromising the right hand and wrist position. And that brings us to the final axis we'll be using the z-axis, which is going to give us the vertical rotation of the guitar. We'll use this mainly for minor tweaks to further optimize the hand positions. A good example to demonstrate this is the wrist issue from the, the lateral rotation earlier. If you end up choosing a backward tilt on the y-axis for the reasons we talked about and feel that your left wrist is bent a little too far, you can use a slight z-rotation back, keeping that tilt, bringing the fingerboard closer to your body and that's going to bring the wrist in a more natural state, right? So we can use the z-axis rotation to really fine-tune that. But there are no hard and fast rules. For example, players with longer arms usually prefer an outward rotation in the opposite direction with less of a y-axis tilt. Here's another application of this. Remember, we talked about clearing the, the forearm from the edge here. After settling on an optimal rotation for the hand positions, if the edge is still pushing too far into your forearm, you can apply a small amount of z-rotation, bringing it back to clear the edge from the forearm. A more nuanced instance is where we discussed keeping the knuckle joints parallel to the fingerboard. There's actually a secondary angle here that's often overlooked. For your default left hand position, you'll want to avoid either side, index or the pinky, staying too far behind the surface of the fingerboard, or too far forward. If you notice you're running into this issue, you can use a little Z rotation to line up your knuckles with the surface instead of having to contort your wrists to line them up. So that's a rundown of each rotation around the axes and their impact on some of the basic techniques. If you're running into a stubborn technical issue at any level, there's a good chance it's rooted in the basics that could go all the way back to your posture and your sitting position. I tend to stay away from general rules about technique because again, there are, there are always some exceptions in the advanced levels but to be able to see these exceptions for what they are, you want to first establish a solid, comfortable baseline position. And when you find that spot, that doesn't mean by no means that you'll be stuck in that fixed state, trying to preserve that posture. An efficient technique should be fluid and dynamic. The key is to develop your technique and repertoire 
keeping these principles in mind and being mindful of the guitar's position and orientation with respect to your posture. That way, if there are momentary changes, like advanced passages, some exceptional situation that tests your limits, you can easily revert to the space line quickly and not letting these momentary changes and exceptions derail your whole technique. To wrap it all up, we'll go over a checklist that you can use to test your own sitting position and make changes using this system. Always start with a single axis. Usually the x-axis is a good starting point. Divide up the rotation into small segments, sort of imaginary arcs. And at each increment, just play through a short piece or a scale so you can test it in action, not just in theory. Small adjustments go a long way, but for the x-axis, these increments should be large enough or noticeable enough to be able to feel the effects clearly on your technique. Let's say you start at about a 45 degree angle, then run the piece again on the next increment, dropping it 10 or 15 degrees. You'll be approximating these angles, of course. You can even align it with different spots in the room. In the next step, do that incremental test for each technical aspect that's a priority to you. For example, do a run through at each increment for the curvature of your fingers, and then your thumb position, the wrist, and so on. Once you find the optimal angle for the X rotation, for the techniques you're targeting or testing for, maintain that angle on the X axis, then add the second axis, the Y axis rotation. Though keep in mind, for the range for the Y axis is going to be much smaller than the X axis. So make very small adjustments as you test. Then add the Z rotation for the final touch. Again, using a very small range. And see if that it improves anything, or if the first two axes are sufficient to find that ideal position. Make sure to take notes for each run through. So you can continue to track changes easily and make better decisions. For example, if you decide that the ideal combination for your right hand wrist, let's say, is a 45 degree X rotation, no Y axis rotation, and about a 10 degree back rotation on the Z axis. Just take a note of that so you can refer back to it and optimize things further. When you come across a, a random tip or even a well-intentioned suggestion, take it with a grain of salt. Don't just adopt it before putting it under this sort of scrutiny. Because keep in mind, there is no singular position that'll just work for everyone out of the box. If at some point you end up changing your sitting position, or let's say switch to a knee support device, you can always come back to this checklist and stress test your new sitting position. In the second part, we'll compare some support devices to see which ones are useful in terms of all these principles. So I'll see you then. Have a great practice.